Hello fellow plot questers and welcome to Aurora's End, the third book in the Aurora Cycle by Amy Kaufman and Jay Kristoff. And well, let's get straight into this wonderful, wonderful book because there is a lot to say. So I'll start with the plot, then I'll talk about the analysis of the book. So let's get straight into the plot. So basically, at Aurora, Aurora Burning, the last book of the series, was a bit of a cliffhanger. We see the weapon freaking disappear while the battle is raging around them, and now we don't know what's happening to our main characters. Well, here's what happened. Aurora, Cal, and Kiarsen, or the Star Slayer, or the big bad Sladrathri, is sent to a dystopian future where the Rahab have taken over. There, they meet Tyler and a couple others lost survivors. Indeed, it had 20 years has passed since their present time, and now the Rahom had taken over, and there's a desperate resistance of sentient species who are fighting against the Rahom. And they believe that the only hope is to fix the weapon and go back to their present, or the past in the perspective of the future, trippy how that works, and prevent this dystopian future from ever happening. However, in order to do so, they must go to the Eshvaran ruins, where the Theta Sector is. And the Theta Sector is covered with Raham, and it will be incredibly hard to go in. Indeed, it will be a sacrifice of every last sentient fighter that we have left. And it will be a sacrifice. A sacrifice of the future to save the past, to save the future. I know, it's kind of complicated. Meanwhile, Scarlet, Finn, and Zila are sent to the past. There, they are discovered that they are in a time loop, where essentially every time they die, they are going back to the past. There, they meet Nari Kim, who is actually a Korean, which is funny because I'm a Korean, and a lot of stuff she talked about, like Kyunggido and Hanabong, are stuff that I know about because I'm Korean, and those are very distinctly Korean things. It was really cool how genuine that was. Very, very fun. And Nari Kim, we find out, is actually the founder of the Aurora Legion. And now we must work together with this Nari Kim, who's, by the way, killed us a couple times because we are a very suspicious floating ship in front of a state of an art space station that's near a goddamn dark matter storm. I know, a lot of fancy dancy sci fi words we're throwing out there. So basically, we need to get out of this time loop. And we can see that the time loop is getting shorter and shorter, so we gotta figure this out. Meanwhile, Tyler is in normal time, and surprise, surprise, Tyler is actually half Sladrathri. And uh, Jericho Jones had married a Sladrathri woman, and Tyler therefore had Sladrathri blood in him. And Saedi, who is uh, Cal's sister and the daughter of the Star Slayer, the Templar of the Unbroken Sladrathri, she is in love with Tyler. She feels the calling. And so Tyler and Saedi has some spicy hot moments, and Tyler realizes he has these visions of the Aurora Legion getting destroyed and the Aurora Academy being destroyed. Therefore, he must go there and stop the destruction, and although Saedi tries to stop him, he leaves her and tries to stop the Aurora Legion from, you know, exploding and dying, because that will be very, very bad. And the, the Raham are sim uh, have activated their agents, and they are brewing international tensions. And all of these international leaders are meeting at the Aurora Academy in an international, well, intergalactic caucus. And if that caucus, as Tyler sees in his vision, gets bombed, then, well, the world will be left without its head. And that will be exactly what the Rahom wants. So we have three different stories going on here. Aurora, Star Slayer, and Cal. They must go to Theta Sector, they must fix their weapon. Scarlet, Finn, and Zila must figure out why the hell they're stuck in a time loop, first of all, and get out of it till it ends and kills them. And third, Tyler is in normal time, and he must stop the Aurora Academy from being kaboomied, because that will mean the end of every leader, of every sentient species, which would, in turn, be very, very bad. Now, what happens with Aurora, Star Slayer, and Cal? So basically, they managed to convince the people that yes, we do need to go to the Theta Sector and sacrifice. So they go for it. 
However, we find out that we cannot actually fix the weapon within the Theta Sector, but Aurora must actually use her abilities and the emotions of the people around her. It's all quite confusing and not made super clear, but I think that's the gist of it. And so there's a very epic sacrifice. We see that in the future, Tyler actually had a kid with Saidi, and we managed to fix the weapon, and we don't know what happens. Next, what about Scarlet, Finn, and Zila? First of all, as I've mentioned, accidentally actually, we meet Nari Kim. And Nari Kim is the founder of the Aurora Legion. And here we find out about this insane, insane time loop shit. We found out that Zila had actually gone, been in the past, as the third founder of the Aurora Legion, and she was the reason why every, why the Aurora Legion commanders knew what they needed and all those pre-planted stuff that was done literally decades before they even joined the academy was actually because Zila had gone to the past and made it happen. The reason why um, Tyler had woke up because his, because his friend was snoring way loudly than usual, that he had to go out on a little bit of a space cruise for fun. The fact that he had found Aurora in the abandoned Haddonfield and set all the, and set the ball rolling, made, I don't know what that phrase is anyways. All of that was pre-planned by Zila, the genius freaking 20 million IQ Newton person. She had pre-planned every single one of those courses so that it would make sense and this would happen and this would happen so that we could win the war against the raw Han. Very, very cool. This is some insane freaking time loop shit. And Zila falls in love with Nari and they live happily ever after, presumably. And finally, they find out that the time loop is actually caused by um, the crystal, the Ishverin crystal that Scarlet possesses. On, on her throat. And by the way, Scarlet and Finn now love each other and are dating. Cool. So there's a lot of romance going on here. And basically, what the essential theory is, the same same necklace, the same crystal, Ashvaran crystal, as Scarlet's is in the space station. Therefore, in order to get out of this loop, they need to shut down the Ashvaran crystal that's in the space station so that um, the connection was severe and the time loop stopped. I, I don't fully understand it, but that's the gist of it. It's very complicated. And it's kind of confusing because there's three different stories happening at once. Meanwhile, Tyler. Tyler gets caught. Uh, yes, he gets caught. But he gets caught on purpose. And he uses an EMP that's hidden in his shoe, a, a courtesy of Zila from the future, who's gone to the past. I know this is re really trippy. And he manages to get into Aurora Academy, stop the bomb, and for now, all seems well. <sighs> so basically, Scarlet and Finn is back with Tyler. We don't know what happened with Aurora and Cal and Star Slayer. However, uh, they are actually bombing Octavia and trying to destroy all of the sp spores before anything happens. However, the Raham actually blooms and takes over those spaceships that are bombing and now suddenly we've got a large amount of really really good fleets taken over by the Raham trying to take everything over and this is a really really bad situation right now. Meanwhile in the future Aurora and Kal and Star Slayer are losing and Kal is about to die. However Star Slayer finally finally shows his final act. He goes out and he fights with them, and finally, in the last deciding moment, he sacrifices himself in his love for his son and protects them and manages to buy enough time for Aurora to fix the weapon. Then, boom. Meanwhile, in the present, there is a final battle going on with the Unbroken and the Aurora Legion alliancing against the Raham fleet. And they are not doing super well, but it's a pretty even fight. And in the decisive, decisive moment, Aurora comes back. And now, since her weapon is fully fixed, with her sacrifice, we can actually kill the raw hum. However, instead, she realizes that the answer is simple. She realizes the answer is love. The raw hum thinks that love is actually combining everything, and like everyone is the same person, therefore we all love each other, and it's accepting. However, Aurora realizes that the reason why love is so beautiful is because every single person has a distinct shade. The, the rainbow is not beautiful because it has one color, it's because there are so many colors combining together. 
Therefore, she enters the Roham and teaches a different meaning of love, the, the beauty of individuality and how only when the individual has their own sentient mind can there be true love. And the Roham listens, question mark, and they freaks off, but Aurora is now forever part of the Roham and she's about to leave with the Roham, but uh, all of her friends decides that, you know, don't go. And even Kat, who's been absorbed in the Roham, says, nope, don't, don't come with us. We want the happy ending for you. And kicks her off the Roham. And now she's back with the squadron. However, she had to give up her psychic powers. So that's about the end of the plot. We see that Saidi and Tyler, the ship has sailed. Um, Scarlet and Finn, the ship has sailed. And finally, of course, the main ship, Aurora and Cal, the ship has sailed. Of, although, of course, the POV is evenly divided among all of the characters uh, with an exclusion of Saidi. Analysis. The plot twist was very well executed and that does connect the dots and the freaking questions we've had about why is the Aurora Legion, why are they aware of what we are gonna do all the time and how did they prepare all of this stuff? This is crazy. How? How, how are they doing that? And it solves a lot of the plot holes and it makes sense, right? It all comes together to this really good plot twist and it's very, very, very trippy. And I think it's super well executed. The callbacks to the previous two books were also pretty awesome. And as usual, the multiple character juggling is masterfully done. However, I think that there's a little bit of a problem uh, in the sense that since we've had three different stories going on, I think there's not enough time and attention given to each of those three different narratives, so it's a little harder for the reader to understand like what's going on. Although the pacing and the character and the characters we've gotten to love so much kind of carries that and kind of makes that a little less impactful, like the those bad parts. However, I think that obviously that is a room for improvement. Another thing is that um, I like the idea behind the ending, but not the execution. And everything from the second half of the book kind of feels uh, rushed. And I think perhaps more time could be spent on this. And, okay, so I'm not talking about like the character growth and stuff. Because like even Kearson, um, the Star Slayer, like his sacrifice made sense. All those subtle hands, nuanced stuff, you know, that makes sense. And those dramatic little character um, moments and those character growth parts uh, did make sense to me. However, it's just the fact that the author needs to explain the complex theme of love and how the ending connects to that love stuff is, is not that good, I think. Because they exposition it. And it works. Like, I'm not saying it doesn't work. Like, love is a very constant theme throughout the entire trilogy. And it, they talk about it a lot. And the characters are obviously, they fall in love with each other, blah, 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 blah. However, having love as the ultimate solution to beat what is essentially a mindless spore monster that consumes people into his hive mind felt a little little out of place I, and i think that deviating from the original kind of stakes of oh we need this weapon to kill all these spores and burn all of them alive uh, i think it was a good variation from that and i think it made sense but it it makes sense on paper but it didn't work as well in reality i think and i think that they needed a lot more nuance and a lot more time to talk about all of these different things, all of these different themes, so that they would make sense at the end and they wouldn't need to exposition it so blatantly through Aurora's monologue and dialogues. However, again, like, I don't, like, I'm, I'm a wannabe writer, right? So I always look at it in the perspective of how hard would this be to write if I was doing it? And honestly, if, even if I was given a decade, this would be hard to pull off. And the fact that these two authors have pulled it off moderately well like pretty well for you know the fact that how complex this writing stuff is and how much they had to juggle and how much story they had to juggle i think they did a phenomenal job and i'll give this book an 8 out of 10 because it was amazing it was a really good end to the trilogy however it had a rushed ending and i thought some of the execution could happen better but again i'm not sure how they would do that Perhaps they could have made this a quartet and not a trilogy and had one more book so that some more time could be spent on some of the more uh, articulate, not articulate, that's the wrong word for it, some of the more special, delicate plot points. That's about it, guys. Would highly recommend this book. It is very, very good. And like always, 
your plot twister and the plot twister. This book is amazing, one of the best sci-fi series I've ever read. Anytime, any day, the Aurora Legion is just an amazing story to read. Have a great day, everyone. Goodbye. Thank you.